So um, welcome to our first uh, ethnic webinar in the uh, field of neonatal critical care. I'm Daniel De Luca, the ethnic medical president. I'm very happy uh, to have you here today. I want you to remember that it's just the first of a long series because ethnic is very much committed to education and science in the field of neonatal and pediatric critical care. And uh, this first series is organized thanks to uh, an educational grant from Vayer, uh, at which we are very, very grateful. And uh, it's just the first of a series because ethnic really wants to invest in this field and wants to gather uh, all the biggest and most important experts from both pediatric and neonatal critical care, and not only dedicate to one of them. So you're more than welcome uh, uh, to be here with us today. I know you are uh, very many actually, and it's just the first of its kind, but we're gonna have many, many of these occasions. And it's also uh, the occasion for me uh, to uh, invite you to join ESPNIC. Uh, we can probably see that from the uh, last slide, as you may see here, uh, you can easily become an ESPNIC member. There are uh, several uh, options to become a member. And by this way, you can get full access and you can exploit all the benefits of becoming ethnic members with all the uh, uh, ethnic educational activities and uh, the possibility to, to, uh, to, to join for our uh, research grants and the possibility to uh, uh, um, join our Congress and to have our journal, Pediatric Intensive Care Medicine, our new journal that is going to be launched very soon, Pediatric and Neonatal Intensive Care Medicine. Uh, so uh, really a unique opportunity. So again, we are um, starting our first webinar and uh, particularly investing in uh, the neonatal critical care field. And the first webinar will be about the uh, neonatal ventilation a very odd topic and that's also an old topic, but here today we have the most important speakers in Europe uh, on, this, on this topic. So Professor Manuel Sanchez Luna will be the first one. Manuel is a good friend of mine and I'm very, very grateful for uh, his friendship. And I think uh, in his no presentation is the president of the Spanish Society of Neonatology with an impressive curriculum for his researches um, in neonatal ventilation and particularly in high frequency ventilation. And uh, uh, nothing more than that, it's a real expert and uh, somebody that actually loves to teach. And so uh, we're very happy to have him here today teaching us about this topic. So uh, thanks Manuel for being here. So hello everyone. First of all, I would like to thank uh, my very good friend, Professor Danny De Luca. He is um, an impressive uh, uh, researcher as well uh, for many years, and now he's pushing so hard this ethnic. And I hope that you know the uh, society of pediatric and neonatal intensive care is going to improve and go faster and higher than before. So many thanks, Daniel, uh, Daniel, for inviting me to to be with here with you and with all of you. So the topic is going to be um, related to uh, if we have or not to uh, use volume guarantee together with uh, high frequency ventilation. This is my uh, conflict of interest, but I must say that all of the studies that I'm going to show you have been um, done with uh, international by national uh, grants. So um, I uh, wanted to uh, start Remember you that at least in uh, mechanical ventilation, uh, the trauma related to the ventilator is clearly uh, related to the large tidal volume that we have been using. So far in the more immature babies, in the more immature uh, premature babies, this has been a tremendous problem because most of the ventilator from a very long time didn't control neither uh, look at the tidal volume that we were using in, in them. Mostly during the first few days of the delivery, uh, the tidal volume is highly variable. And many times it's unpredictable to know exactly how much do we have to, to use. And depends many times, not only the lung mechanics, 
and in the ventilator mechanic, but also how the baby's breathing spontaneously or not, how the baby is synchronized with the ventilator if uh, he or she is contributing to the creation of the tidal volume, how is the, the tracheal position of, uh, of uh, the tube? If, if it is not uh, or is, is present or not, uh, some leakage, or um, whatever many uh, other problems related to uh, the position of uh, these two. From uh, several years, we know that um, in at least in uh, conventional mechanical ventilation, uh, we have uh, enough evidence that using this kind of uh, volume guarantee, which is the most uh, um, uh, used uh, way of control the tidal volume during uh, continuous flow and pressure limited ventilation really represent a benefit to, to babies. This is one of the last um, uh, review of the Cochrane in 2017. As you can see that with the use of this uh, modality of uh, controlling the tidal volume, mostly most of the studies, uh, as I told you, were done with the volume guarantee modality, you can have uh, at least um, a benefit in terms of uh, decreasing death before the discharge from the hospital, death or BPD, duration of mechanical ventilation, pneumothorax, and what is even more important for us as neonatologists, we can uh, face a decrease in the trauma uh, related to uh, brain injury, decreasing the number of babies with uh, severe IVH, grade three or four, or PVL. But also we have uh, decreasing the number of babies who develop uh, BPD. So with this in mind, knowing that in conventional ventilation, at least, the use of volume guarantee modality in the more immature babies can represent an advantage. Uh, more than uh, 11 years ago, um, high frequency ventilation was um, uh, thought that probably the use of this modality together, controlling the tidal volume during high frequency clan can also be an improvement. So as you can see here in this uh, graphic, uh, the most of uh, ventilators doing high frequency oscill oscillation uh, produce what we call a tidal volume less than the dead space, the anatomical dead space, what is called high frequency tidal volume. And this tidal volume can be produced by increasing delta P, which is the pressure that the ventilation is producing, is the ventilator is producing during high frequency. And this can be done also by modifying the frequency. So for many years, if you wanted to increase the PCU2 leverage from the baby, what we were doing is to increase delta P or decrease the frequency of the ventilator, trying to give more time to the oscillator to produce more tidal volume. So now, um, more than 11 years ago, we uh, had the possibility to combine this volume guarantee modality to the ventilator using this philosophy, given the set of the tidal volume during high frequency to the ventilator. And the ventilator, what is going to do is just modify the amplitude during the ventilation. So now for the very first time, you can modify in an independent way, the tidal volume, the frequency and delta P. So I'm going to show you all of the studies that we have been doing from um, um, the beginning of uh, the combination of this high frequency together with the uh, volume guarantee modality. Here in the screen, you can see uh, the standard, the classic um, tidal volume variation during high frequency when you modify the frequency. You can see here in this uh, graphic how when you go from 5 to 15 hertz, the tidal volume that is produced by the ventilator is decreasing step by step. But now with the volume guarantee modality together with the high frequency, you can see how at any single frequency that you set, if you use this volume guarantee modality, then the tidal volume is going to be constant. So I'm going to show you one of the first studies that we did some years ago in neonatal um, piglets uh, before and after producing a severe decrease in the compliance by the bronchoalveolar lavage. Here you have the PCU2, and here you have different tidal volumes that we were setting from 2, 2.5, and 3 ml per kilogram of body weight before and after decreasing the compliance by producing this bronchoalveolar lavage. So you can see how anytime you 
increase the tidal volume, you have a decrease in the PCO2. But whatever is more important, after decreasing the compliance of the lung, you can see how the PCO2 remains constant because the ventilator was adjusting delta P to maintain this uh, set in the tidal volume during high frequency. So you can see what the ventilator is doing when you anytime increase the tidal volume, the ventilator is increasing delta P to keep this tidal volume in the setting. So to look um, closer, what was the ventilator doing in this modality, we developed this um, uh, testing lung um, in the lab with uh, CO2 produced into, the, into this uh, testing lung. And we wanted to know exactly how the delta P was transmitted from the proximal airway to the inside of this uh, testing uh, lung uh, uh, that we were uh, using. First of all, you can see here, and this is again for the very first time, we could demonstrate that uh, as we increase the frequency with the volume guarantee modality, this is the, the close uh, uh, dots here, you can see how this U2, which is the marker of the alveolar ventilation, the high frequency ventilation increases. Normally during high frequency ventilation, as I told you at the beginning, when you decrease uh, when you increase the frequency, you have a drop in the efficacy of the ventilator in DCO2. So now for the, for the very first time, you can see how the ventilator really improves CO2 uh, washout when you increase the frequency. But what was happening with the pressure? Because we were uh, a little bit concerned about the possibility of the delta pressure can damage uh, into the lungs of the babies. So here you can see in the blue color, the proximal uh, airway pressure during delta P during high frequency ventilation at different uh, frequencies. And you can see how the proximal pressure increases, but the internal pressure, the pressure inside the testing lung didn't modify. If you switch off uh, the volume guarantee modality and you look at the standard high frequency ventilation, you can see how anytime you increase the frequency, there is a drop in all of the delta P pressures. And this, this is probably why during many years, most of the ventilators were used at around 10 Hertz to keep delta P constant. You can see here, this is a direct analysis of this pressure in white color. This is the proximal oscillation. Anytime you increase the frequency, there is an increase in the proximal. But you can see in the purple color and the yellow and, and the green color that there is no change in the uh, internal pressure into the uh, testing line. Well, we, we did some studies to know exactly the effect of this new modality in terms of I to E ratio. As you know, anytime you increase the inspiratory time, you will have more time to produce higher tidal volume. And this is why without the volume guarantee modality, and again, this is a study done in animals, in our uh, animal lab, uh, we analyzed the effect of using without the volume guarantee different I to E ratio, one to one or one to two. In different situations before and after uh, uh, producing this decrease in the bronchial, uh, in, in the compliance of the lung. And you can see how when you were, you were using one to one ratio, the tidal volume was higher and the PCO2 was lower compared to I to one to one to one to two, I to E ratio. But in the volume guarantee modality, the surprise was that anytime you modify the I to E ratio, there's no change in the tidal volume because the tidal volume is fixed. And now the ventilator is more effective in decreasing the PCO2 using the shorter inspiratory time with a one to two I to E ratio before and after the bronchial velar lavage. So this is the, uh, I to E ratio that we recommend to use um, with the volume guarantee modality. We wanted to test if using this modality, we could analyze much better if the lung of the baby is well recruited. Because you have to remember that during high frequency ventilation, you need a very well recruited lung in your babies to produce 
oxygenation and ventilation. So this study was done by Ana Rodriguez Sanchez de la Blanca in our animal lab. And what we, we was testing that um, probably looking at delta P after increasing step by step the mineral pressure of the ventilator, we can set exactly the better situation of the lung. So this is uh, one of the studies that we did. This is an, an ex vivo model. You can see these are lungs coming from uh, rats. And after increasing mean overpression from 5, 14, 26, and 38, you can see how there is a drop in delta P until a number around 19. And then no other increase in the mean overpression was producing a decrease in delta P. Demonstrated that you know we can look at the delta P to know exactly if our lungs are well recruited and no not overdistended. We repeat the study in the full animal, the complete animal, in vivo animal, and we look at the PCO2 arterial PCO2, and again we saw exactly the same. When we were increasing mineral pressure, there was a drop in delta P until certain value. That was exactly the same in the increase in the oxygenation. After this certain value, no more increase in the oxygenation we found. So with this in mind, we wanted to test if using the lowest tidal volume possible uh, and compensating this DCO2 by increasing the frequency, at least in the most immature babies, we can protect the lung from the uh, ventilator-induced uh, lung trauma. So this study done by Noelia Gonzalez Pacheco in. Uh, three years ago was a very nice study where we test the hypothesis that using 20 hertz with very low tidal volume instead of 10 hertz with the standard tidal volume will produce after 12 hours of high frequency ventilation in an animal neonatal model a protection in the, into the lung. You can see here this is the electronic microscopy of the 10 hertz 12 hour standard tidal volume with a tremendous damage of the lung epithelium into the alveolar. And in the same um, uh, electronic uh, imaging, you can see how in the group of animals that we were using 20 hertz with very, very low tidal volume during 12 hours, the lung was uh, maintained very, very well. Uh, normally structure. You can see here, this is the lung microscopy in the group of animals with 10, versus 20, you can see how the lungs in the 20 hertz group with very low tidal volume, the score of the damage of the lung were significantly lower compared to the 10 hertz. So with this in mind, we began to use this philosophy in our premature babies. And this is the very first study that we published in 2016 by Noelia Gonzalez Pacheco again. And we test the hypothesis that after stabilization of the baby, then on high frequency ventilation, what we did is to try to increase the frequency and decrease the tidal volume as much as possible and to know how the babies were doing. So we recruit uh, a number of babies, most of them less than 32 weeks gestation. And you can see that before and after we decrease the tidal volume from 2.2 to 1.6 with a statistical significant improvement in the oxygen saturation, and we could decrease FIU2, and the babies were doing much better. But what was very important for us is that the ventilator didn't increase very much delta P. So the babies were moving from very standard uh, tidal volume to very low tidal volume with higher frequency without any kind of problem. So the baby were doing very well. So we look at the, what we, we were doing with this strategy in two different periods from 2012 and 2013, and after 2016 and 2017. And this study was done by Cristina Ramos Navarro. And we analyzed the effect of using this new strategy. And you can see how most of the babies with severe respiratory failure, very immature babies, less than 32 weeks gestation, were managed by this, uh, uh, handled by this high frequency combined to the volume guarantee modality, and we found uh, a statistical significant decrease in severe BPD. So finally, we review, and this study was done by one of our fellows, Gonzalo Solis, what we were doing with this 
strategy in our babies. And we review 116 new births using this um, technology uh, from the beginning. And you can see that most of the babies that we were using this technology were very, very immature babies below 26 weeks in station. These were the characteristics of uh, the babies divided in different groups in terms of the frequency that we were using. And you can see that we were even using frequencies as high as 19 to 20 Hertz. And this frequency so high was used in the smaller babies, mean uh, birth weight of 500 grams. And you can see that there is a clear relationship between the frequency and the tidal volume. The higher is the frequency, the lower is the tidal volume that we could use in our babies. And we found this uh, sinusoidal uh, relationship between the tidal volume and frequency. So at the higher frequency, the lower tidal volume was possible. So in summary, what we, I wanted to, to show you is that today, at least, we can use high frequency ventilation combined with the tidal volume, volume guarantee modality, and we can fix and set independently of the frequency and the delta P to maintain the PCO2. And probably the use of this very low tidal volume can be used in these premature babies to reduce the risk of immature lung injury by the ventilator. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Manuel, for this excellent presentation. I think we'll come back with a few questions at the end on this topic. Myself and Peter Rimmensberg in co-chair with Daniel De Luca this session. And as we have the instructions, we go on straight to the next presentation uh, by Tom Goose, who is a clinical researcher at the Erasmus University of Rotterdam. And he will talk about moving towards artificial intelligence intelligent world in mechanical ventilation. Why should I use PRICO? PRICO is the abbreviation of predictive intelligent control oxygenation. This is an oxygen control, which is built in, in one of the company's devices that are on the market, just to mention there are others on, on the field at the moment. So please give us a better insight in this closed loop concept. So thank you, Professor Runesberger for the introduction. and. I should start with saying that this talk is not so much about why you should use Prico, but mainly why you should use closed loop control of the FiO2 in general, because I think that's the most important part. Um, because the differences between the different algorithms is, is much, much smaller than the actual effect of using it at all. Uh, so we have a number of uh, research collaborations that I need to disclose. Um, so that's with a number of companies. And like always, I should say that yeah, whatever anybody tells you, you should take with a grain of salt. And for us, that's no different. So as a, a Dutchman, uh, we're famous for being blunt and honest. Uh, so I think it's good to start with that closed loop control of the amount of inspired oxygen is not the problem or not the solution to everything. And the main problem is that it actually doesn't solve the cause of your problem giving more oxygen uh, temporarily fixes the saturation of the, the premature infant that we're ventilating, um, but probably doesn't solve the cause why the, why the saturation has dropped to begin with. So that's something to really keep in mind, uh, that these controllers, no matter what uh, company or which ventilator you use, will never solve that problem. It will only mask, uh, in that case, the event, uh, limit the, the oxygen desaturation, um, but yeah, it can really hide suboptimal ventilation and it can also mask a deteriorating patient because uh, when your patient is deteriorating and is requiring more and more oxygen, it might be the case that these controllers give it, uh, give more oxygen to the patient and you might actually not notice. So these are some things that we need to keep in mind um, that are partially solvable, but also partially just the reality of, of how these systems work. And then there are some current limitations. And one of the, the most pressing and most annoying in day to day is that we need a secondary pulse oximeter probe in most systems uh, to measure the actual oxygen saturation feed it into the ventilator. 
So that means that we have premature infants with two pulse oximeters. And I think everybody agrees that that's suboptimal. Uh, and that's something we would ideally, of course, solve. But again, it's one of the realities of how these systems work at the moment. But with, with that, we get the additional settings that we have to set uh, saturation targets twice, think about alarm limits twice. And uh, so yeah, basically we are basically doubling up our work, uh, but also the amount of, of things we need to think about. And then currently, almost all the, the controllers on the market, at least, are uh, fixed controllers in the sense uh, to say that they have a, a control scheme and that will be limited in its amount of how much it can adjust uh, to what it learns from the specific patient it is on. And ideally, of course, you would like a, a controller, a ventilator that learns from your patient. Like, hey, I gave it a certain amount of oxygen in addition. It responded in this way. And from that, we need to learn better how it should respond next time. And so there's some room for improvement. And then overall, the, the biggest current limitation we have is that we don't actually know precisely what the optimal target for each and every patient is. We're still struggling to know the optimal target for all patients in general. Um, but of course, between different preterm infants, there's likely to be a small difference that the extreme preterms might need a bit less oxygen, where an older term infant needs more oxygen. Although specifically yeah, specific targets, uh, we don't really know in that much detail. And that really limits us in setting specific targets for patients. But luckily, there are big, big benefits. And the biggest one of all is that a closed loop controller is always quicker than a human. Uh, so just that response time basically will result in that pretty much every patient that is put on an automatic controller will be within the saturation targets more of the time. Uh, and that really is the biggest benefit. Um, and that with that also the reduction in work, because of course now the, the nurses that take care of these patients don't have to react to every saturation dip. Uh, and part of that workload is taken up by the ventilator uh, to really adjust the minutia uh, on day-to-day -day stuff. And then um, with that reduction of, of ventilation uh, on the ventilator, they really should be able to improve the care for the patient in, in other aspects where they can actually add more benefit to it. And the other big benefit is that these controllers are consistent. They always react basically in the same way um, if the same event occurs. Uh, so that also makes studies much more uh, repeatable and representative of the actual things we're doing. Uh, so actually that should really benefit us in figuring out those saturation targets. Like I say, this is not so much a, a story about should I use Preco, but much more about should I use a closed loop controller? Well, then the question, of course, does it matter which one I use? And the answer to that is somewhat more difficult because um, sure, there are differences between the closed loop controllers, um, but that's not the main thing to worry about. Because really the most important thing is, uh, okay, which ventilator actually works best for me? Um, and that's a much bigger influence to what we do to the patient is, okay, you need to know the ventilator you work with. It needs to fit into the workflow of the unit uh, and the hospital. And there might be other big features that you uh, like or actually require that are more important than the differences between closed loop controllers. And the other thing is that it's very difficult to say uh, which controller is the best uh, in general you might be able to do something there, but especially for each patient, it might differ. Because a patient uh, that is just a, an extreme newborn uh, with fresh lungs might benefit from another controller than a patient that's been on a unit for two months, has developed a severe BPD, uh, and it requires only little oxygen, but is much more sensitive to changes in that oxygen. So that's a difficult problem where not necessarily one controller is best for both of those patients. But to briefly tell you a bit about uh, the other topics I will talk about today, um, most of the talk will be about actually setting up the closed loop controller and especially what the effect of the SpO2 targets that you set is. Because uh, that's something that will influence each and every controller and it might differ a bit between controllers, but it has quite a bit big effect on what it actually does and what is actually delivered to the patient. Um, then to briefly discuss, okay, which features are actually important uh, on the ventilator side. And then a bit about artificial intelligence and 
okay, is that something that would benefit closed loop control? And when can we expect that? Uh, and then also a bit of an outlook to the future of closed loop control, um, going beyond just oxygen, because there's, of course, a lot more we could control. <clears throat> so to start with setting up a closed loop controller, the big benefit of a closed loop controller, like I said, is the response time. And so it is there all the time, it will respond instantly. Uh, and really that's, that's the biggest advantage. Um, but you can help that a bit by shortening averaging times, because uh, basically the shorter the averaging time, the quicker the ventilator response or the other way around. If you lengthen that averaging time, the response will slow down. Um, and with that, you can basically make the, the ventilator react quicker. And the other thing is to pay attention to which limits you set. And that can be uh, both the range of the oxygen, so how much FiO2 can the ventilator provide. So usually the 21 at the bottom end is not so much the point, but especially on the top end, you need to think about, okay, how much is it allowed to give to the patient before I at least want to get a notification or a hard limit. Uh, but that way, you know when the patient deteriorates, and you know uh, that you need to check at least, okay, what's the cause of that deterioration? Um, and that can be a bit more, so 10% more, or if you're more confident, 20% more. Uh, but just giving the ventilator free hand to do anything between 21 and 100% oxygen probably isn't wise. Because uh, then it could be the case that you come back to the patient and where you started off at a lower oxygen saturation, uh, low oxygen percentage, but now the patient has deteriorated and is on a very high percentage. So the other thing um, is how to set the actual SpO2 targets. Um, well, luckily, uh, this is a very open door, but what you set as a target really has an effect on outcome. Um, and not only in the sense that that's the actual target that you achieve, uh, but also how the spread around that target is uh, and how big that is. But there have been a couple of studies, um, one here uh, showing that if you take a, a narrower target, you actually do shift uh, the trend and uh, the median of the, the saturation. Uh, but you see that it's not perfectly within the bounds that you want to. Um, and it holds up uh, in another study by the group from Antel van Kaam in, uh, in Amsterdam, where they basically did a similar study comparing two saturation targets. Uh, but if you look at the actual achieved saturations, you see that uh, there's quite a big tail, especially on the higher end of the saturation target. Um, and that's something that if we overlay them and highlight them, you can really see that in that sense, the controller really did its job was independent of the actual saturation target, it has the same problem. That it, it basically is not reacting quick enough to high saturations uh, and dialing down the amount of oxygen quick enough. So we see a, a couple of patients or probably all patients that at some point achieve saturation targets above uh, the set target. And this is something to do with uh, how controllers react. Because um, in a a study published by the group from Leiden, they uh, compared different saturation targets around the same mean, basically narrowing the target. Um, and you see that a narrower target of the, F, uh, of the uh, SpO2 really reduced the time uh, both in hypoxia and hyperoxia, um, but only by limiting those, those yeah, tails on the spread. So basically the controller performs better if you give it a more precise target. Um, here highlighting the differences that we see. You see the big box is uh, the largest target in blue. And then by narrowing the target, you do see that the actual achieved saturation gets narrower as well, but not as much as the actual control target is. Um, so what we see here is an effect of response time of the controllers. Um, you can imagine when a, a patient is in the target and everything is in order, uh, and the controller does nothing. And basically, as soon as the saturation steps outside of that box, the FAO2 is adjusted, but it takes a while for the patient to respond to that FAO2 change. And then again, some time for the SpO2 measurements or the pulse oximeter to pick up that change. Well, and by narrowing that target, basically we see that, okay, the controller responds quicker. Uh, in the sense that 
it steps out of, of over that line quicker. But then this entire process doesn't change in time. It still takes time for the ventilator to react, for the patient to respond, and for the measurement to measure that response. So in that sense, controllers can work in a number of ways. Uh, so the controllers we see now uh, mostly target a range. So you give a higher and a lower target. Um, and then there is a choice to do nothing within that target range. So basically to let the patient more or less free as long as they're within the target and only responds one day, once they step over the line. The other option is that we set a single value that you say, okay, I want a saturation of 91. Uh, and the controller constantly tries to keep that patient on that specific value. The downside, of course, is that that's almost impossible. Uh, so you will be adjusting the oxygen all of the time. And then there is a combination of the two where you can say, okay, I set a range, but within that range, I target a specific point with much smaller adjustments. So for instance, I will always target the middle or the, 95th, uh, the 75th percentile of that range. And the benefit is uh, that you can basically nudge the patient a bit uh, to a desired range without giving a lot of oxygen changes. Because you can say, okay, as long as it's within the target, I only want a response uh, every so often uh, and a much smaller uh, step size, for instance. And that's a bit how uh, Preco works. Um, basically, it uses short-term saturation changes uh, to give a prediction and to basically look ahead at to, okay, this patient now is improving or deteriorating. Uh, and if it continues on this path, uh, it will step over the target. So with that, you can already start adjusting the oxygen a bit. Um, and of course, the idea behind it is that those tails outside of the target range are much smaller. Uh, and hopefully you can react quicker than you would normally could if you would just look at, okay, when is my patient stepping over the target and just reacting at that point. Um, the downside of this is that it's a technique that benefits of a, a broader range because uh, you can basically predict better when the patient is stepping over that range. You have a bit more time to respond and a bit more time also to estimate uh, basically what the patient is doing. So how hard uh, is their desaturation going and how deep will it go? And then another thing that we, we really are looking for is, is uh, okay, how are closed loops doing in general? So the long-term outcome. And luckily the group uh, of Axel Franz is looking into this with the FAO2C study uh, to really study the effect uh, of closed loop controllers uh, then in that regard of patient outcome, because uh, all the studies thus far really have shown that, okay, uh, all these controllers are better at keeping the patient in range um, and might reduce workload, uh, but it also comes at a cost of uh, more oxygen changes. And usually also with a slightly higher uh, amount of oxygen purely because the algorithm keeps the patient within the target more of the time, uh, and that requires a bit more oxygen. Um, and that might be a trade-off that might not be good for the patient. Uh, so that's something that uh, it's really good that this is being checked uh, in this study. And hopefully, once that is proven, we can move on towards yeah, basically figuring out the next questions. And that's, okay, uh, which saturation target really is optimal for which patient? Uh, how does that relate to oxygen exposure? Um, and one of the questions that, uh, that people have asked is, okay, is pulse oximetry actually accurate enough? Uh, and to that, yeah, it's also hard to really answer. Um, in that sense, it's what we have, it's what we use. Um, so it might not be optimal, but yeah, it's the best we have. So then to go back a step and look at the ventilator. Well, like I said at the beginning, Basically, the most important thing is that you have a good ventilator, that you can really ventilate the patient in the optimal way, because uh, oxygen really is only a, a, yeah, a stopgap uh, to help uh, short-term problems that you see with the patient. Uh, and there's nothing better than good ventilation. So setting stuff like volume guarantee and using a technique like FOTS to optimize ventilation uh, really benefits the patient. And then the closed-loop controllers are there 
basically to adjust and uh, counteract any minute problems that you have. So things that really benefit uh, the use of a closed loop controller uh, within the unit is that it uses the same pulse oximeter that the patient monitor uses. Uh, so then you see less differences between the two measurements. Uh, and also it's more practical from a logistics point of view that you can use the, the same sensors. Um, and it's practical to have an interface that uh, basically copies the data to an electronic patient record, or at least log both the saturation and FAO2 data uh, so that you can see how it is performing, but also how the patient is doing. Because again, uh, small deteriorations or even longer term de deteriorations of the patients now can be masked basically by changing the FIO2. Uh, so it's good to have something in place to look back at that and see how it was. And then it is important that you are able to set both the saturation target, but also alarms around that, uh, and also the FIO2 range. So what can be given and also set alarms on that so that you know, okay, when are we at the end uh, of that range? And so that you get notified that you need to look at the patient. And an important thing to think about is um, which parts or which of the, the parameters are monitored by which system. So usually the, the SPO2, so the pulse oximeter, uh, the alarms is, is mainly handled by the patient monitor. And so put the ones on the ventilator, uh, the alarm ranges wider than that, so that you don't get two alarms when a patient has a simple desaturation. Um, but only the patient monitor controls that. Uh, otherwise, you're doubling up on your alarms. And I think all of us agree that we have too many of those anyway. So then the challenging topic of artificial intelligence. Well, that's a system that really uh, benefits more complex things than just FIO2 control. Um, so where we now see... Uh, a wish that we have better algorithms that could learn from previous patients, but that's something that basically is, is baked into our current algorithms. All the algorithms are developed on results from previous patients. Um, and like I said, we really would like controllers that also learn from the current patients to see, okay, how is this one comparing to all the others? And can we adjust how we're giving oxygen uh, in the most optimal way? Well, that's something that can still be done by by classical control algorithms. You don't need artificial intelligence for that. Um, but we do need ventilators that are uh, somewhat more sophisticated than the ones we have now, uh, with some more compute power than in most cases is available. Um, and it is a challenging point from a regulatory point of view to make a controller that is adjustable, uh, especially over a broad range, uh, and still be able to get that through CE mark or FDA. Well, the re real benefit of artificial intelligence uh, comes for more complex cases um, to also see, okay, uh, to predict how will they respond uh, to the settings that we change, uh, but also how big the, the response will be, so how big the step size will need to be. Uh, and it needs to continue to learn that. Um, and that's especially interesting for more complex interactions. So if we, for instance, combine it with volume guarantee, uh, to see, okay, if we now raise the pressure to give a bigger breath, uh, how does that influence the amount of oxygen that we give? Um, and then really to predict before we actually do that. Um, but to do that, uh, it is important to keep in mind that we do make something that's not a black box, um, that you can see what is done and why it's done, and really communicate that clearly, because otherwise you're basically counting on whoever's next to the bed to trust that the ventilator knows what it's doing. Um, yeah, and that's a big ask to, to ask of anybody. So looking a bit more to the future, um, we see now ventilators that are controlling flow and oxygen and pressure. Uh, we see ventilators that control tidal volume and now systems that control the FiO2. Um, but the future is much more about the the bigger questions, oxygenation in general, so the combination of FiO2, PEEP and tidal volume, uh, and CO2, so the, the frequency and the tidal volumes. Um, and it's not so much reacting to those changes, but really predicting them and preventing the, the problems that we see. Uh, and then we might end up with a ventilator that after you set 
the type of ventilation mode that you want, that you only are left with a choice. Uh, that is quite difficult between, okay, how much pressure do I accept and how much oxygen do I accept? Because uh, that's really the big question left where at the moment we don't have a, a clear cut answer, uh, you know, which one we can sustain how much from. Because uh, sometimes it's picking really the problem of, uh, of one of the two. I'm left with thanking the rest of the group, um, both at Erasmus and at the Technical University in Delft, uh, and thanking you for your time uh, and hopefully answering your questions at the end. Okay, thank you, Tom. I think uh, Daniele De Luca is still trying to get back on audio, but he's back, so I'll let him introduce the next speaker. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, thanks, everyone. So now is my pleasure to introduce you, uh, Professor De Laca. Rafael is another good friend of us and another lover of mechanical violation. For those of you who uh, uh, does not know him, Rafael is uh, an excellent bioengineer. And I'm very happy to have him here today because uh, I do believe that in this area we should be and we should be as much as possible multidisciplinary. We need people like Raffaele and uh, Raffaele needs us to understand how we can improve uh, from a technical point of view, uh, the ventilation for our newborn babies. So Raffaele is a very uh, big expert with uh, a contribution to many patents that are now using our ventilators on the bedside and uh, uh, will be uh, talking about the use of forced oscillation technique, uh, a middle that sees him as uh, probably the biggest expert and inventor in the world. Thank you, Rafael, for being here. Daniele, thank you very much for your very kind uh, introduction. I'm also very happy to be here. I would like to thank you, the organizer and ESPNIC, for uh, organizing such a, a nice event. This is my slide with a conflict of interest. We have several collaboration with companies. As uh, you are seeing, we are biomedical engineers, so we like to develop technologies. And uh, this, uh, today, uh, the talk uh, will be focused uh, on uh, measuring uh, respiratory mechanics in new during mechanical ventilation. Uh, we will especially focus, as you were saying, uh, on the force oscillation technique, uh, which is known also for, as uh, oscillometry, which is a technology that is uh, spreading in lung function test application for adults and pediatrics, but uh, is still at the beginning of uh, its introduction in mechanical ventilation and especially for uh, newborns. So we will um, try to understand how this which are the uh, principles behind this uh, technology and to interpret the results that uh, it can provide. And uh, we will uh, evaluate uh, and discuss possible application of this technology in the neonatal intensity care unit. So as we were saying, this technology is aimed to measure respiratory mechanics. So why we want to know the mechanical properties of the respiratory system? So we know that this inf essential information for evaluating uh, the treatments, for making proper diagnosing, and for tailoring also the respiratory support. But unfortunately, this kind of measurement is uh, not uh, yet available in uh, by, uh, methods and technologies that can be applied at bedside. What we learned so far was uh, learned thanks to, to very difficult and complex technologies that requires uh, a lot of time, uh, the basics, such as the Zorajel balloon technique, and uh, they need a lot of expertise for uh, being uh, interpreted. Because of this, uh, especially when we have patients that have spontaneous activities, we are not able to provide accurate information on mechanics at bedside. So why we have this problem? What is uh, uh, respiratory mechanics uh, means that the study of the relationship be pressure, between the pressures that are acting on the respiratory systems and the, the flow and volumes, the displacement uh, that uh, these pressures are able to produce uh, into the lungs of our patients. So when we use mechanical ventilator, we are actually measuring pressure and volume and flow. So in principle, we have all the information that are uh, needed to compute uh, dynamic compliance, resistance, and all these uh, parameters are characterized in the mechanical properties. However, when we have the patient that is breathing spontaneously, the patient is using the muscles to produce pressure that is applied to the lung, to the chest wall, the pleura. And uh, in this setting, the pressure that we measure at the ventilator is no longer representing the total amount of forces that are acting on the lung. And uh, this evaluation, 
that is provided by the ventilator in this condition is wrong. In order to understand what is the contribution of the respiratory muscles, we need to measure the pleural pressure, which is usually estimated by using the esophageal balloon. The technology that I was saying is invasive, very complex. The balloon is difficult to position. The interpretation of the results are quite tricky. The other option should be, uh, could be to uh, switch off the respiratory muscles, but this means that uh, we will need to paralyze the patient. And we know that uh, this is something that we don't want to do in uh, our patients unless uh, strictly necessary. The force oscillation technique has been introduced back in 1956 by Arthur Dubois, and the principle is, in my opinion, quite smart. So the, the basic idea is to apply a very high frequency but uh, low amplitude forcing pressure at the airway opening. So it's sort of a H HFO ventilation, but the amplitude is quite, quite small. Uh, this uh, pressure is applied to the respiratory system, and uh, at the same time, we are measuring the flow. If you see this, uh, uh, look at, the, for example, the tracings, you can see the pressure and flow during a typical fault measurement. You can uh, clearly understand uh, how the slow varying activity due to the respiratory uh, muscles, the uh, spontaneous activity of the patient is characterizing the signal, and you can identify the very high speed changes of pressure and flow that are produced uh, by the machine that is applying uh, the force oscillation to the device. So by using mathematical algorithms, now it's possible to split, to distinguish the slow spontaneous breathing signal from the muscles from the fast oscillatory component that is uniquely produced by the machine, the ventilator, the pod device. And so we can uh, consider only the fast oscillatory component to estimate the mechanical property of the respiratory system, regardless of the activities that uh, the uh, respiratory muscles are producing. Measuring the mechanical properties at high frequencies uh, makes things a little bit more difficult than uh, at the the, when we do this at the spontaneous uh, uh, frequency, of the spontaneous breathing frequency. And uh, the measurements that this technology is providing is called uh, the respiratory system impedance that is uh, computed for each single frequency that is used for making the test. This uh, impedance is a complex number that is made by two different uh, components. One is the resistance that is well known by all of us. The other is called reactance with the XRS. The reactance is something that we can consider as related to the inertia and elastic components. If you think about the lung as made of conducting airways and the connected at the end to the alveoli that are producing the elastic component of the lung, we can say that the reactance is related by this mathematical formula to the inertia and the compliance of the system, uh, while the resistance is expressing the resistance of the conducting airways. This is a simplification, but is uh, uh, helping a lot uh, to understand and interpret the results of the, uh, that are provided by the FOT. And you can see, for example, in this graph, in which we are using several frequencies for testing the mechanical impedance of the lung, and uh, we uh, compare the results that we can have uh, in a stand normal lung uh, that are uh, uh, expressed by the resistance uh, is normal lung, this dashed line, and the reactance of the normal lung, that is the, the green continuous line. What happens, for example, if we have uh, an obstruction at the level of the airways? What we observe is that we have an increase in the airway resistance that we measure. Conversely, if we have uh, a peripheral uh, uh, change on lung mechanics, for example, due to lung volume per equipment, now we see that the reactance uh, is changing and not the resistance. And this change is moving the reactance toward the negative values. And uh, this is in line with this mechanical and uh, mathematical relationship that is suggesting can, that uh, lower compliance implies more negative lower reactance. This technology as the advantage that can be easily applied in different settings. Here you can see spontaneous breathing, as we were saying before, but we can be easily overimposed to conventional mechanical ventilation, where we can see the small amplitude of oscillation overimposed to the mechanical breath, or during HFOV, where uh, we are already actually giving to the patient uh, uh, high frequency uh, forcing pressures. 
Uh, this technology, as I was saying, uh, is largely uh, is why actually is used uh, uh, and uh, widening uh, its application in the lung function test uh, in the field of lung function test. And we recently also, as a task force of the repair respiratory site, published the technical standards for uh, uh, creating this kind of devices for making these measurements and for interpreting the results. Uh, we are still at the beginning for the application in EQs. So this is also because. Uh, uh, we had to solve several challenging uh, issues uh, when we move our measurements to the small uh, amplitude of flow uh, and the very high loads that are uh, uh, provided by the neonatal lungs. Uh, nevertheless, uh, this technology has a lot of potential application that we are exploring. Uh, why? Is a, because it is non-invasive, does not require patient cooperation, so it can be applied uh, in new ones. It probes continuously lung mechanics, even in presence of a spontaneous breathing, as we were saying before. And uh, it's also uh, suitable for being easily integrated in mechanical ventilators. While at the beginning, uh, it was necessary to have loudspeakers and extra devices uh, in order to produce these uh, force oscillations. Now ventilators can produce uh, the signals by themselves, uh, and they are also already measuring flow and pressure. So we can uh, modify ventilators without changing the hardware, but just adding uh, computational uh, algorithms inside the ventilator. And this is why uh, modern ventilators and uh, modern uh, devices are uh, uh, now uh, appearing in the market that are able to apply FOT in infants uh, in, in, the, in the ones, making this technology available. So I would like to show you some of the possible application that uh, a lung function, actually a lung mechanics monitoring tool uh, may have uh, in the NICU. And uh, I will start uh, with the first application that is the one that we actually explore for uh, more time. That is the uh, possibility to monitor patients, but especially with the aim to optimize ventilation parameters. So the first application that is the uh, most important that we uh, actually developed was uh, uh, a tool that is uh, helping to implement uh, uh, a uh, protective lung ventilation strategy. We know that uh, in order to uh, use the uh, it's best uh, the available lung in our fragile patients, we need to recruit the lung uh, by increasing the pressure. And then uh, we need to release the pressure in order to have the tidal volume being delivered in a region of the pressure volume course in which the lung is not still not the recruited, but is not also overextended. So we need to find the mechanical small window that allows us to minimize the damage to the lung tissue. And uh, how can we do this at that side is a very tricky and difficult task. Uh, we cannot do CT scan, we cannot have a, a static pressure volume curves. What we can do is that we can use FOT uh, combined with a, an increasing and decreasing PIP trial. This is a, an example uh, of uh, an experimental tracing. Here you can see we were using the force oscillation applying during conven conventional mechanical ventilation in patients. You can see the each of these uh, uh, short windows actually uh, are presented on the left panels. You can see the mechanical breath and the force oscillation that is still uh, active and, and present during the expiratory phase. So we, if we change the PIP and repeat these measurements, uh, just the measurements is taking just a few seconds because uh, uh, we just need the very uh, few oscillations in order to estimate uh, uh, the impedance of the lung. So by, by using these measurements during a PIP trial, we can uh, uh, evaluate uh, how the mechanical properties are changing. This is an example of uh, an, a reactance versus PIP uh, measure uh, during a PIP trial in uh, a lung uh, subject to the recruitment. You can see that a very low PIP, uh, the reactance is showing very negative values. Uh, this is suggesting uh, a highly recruited lung. Uh, and uh, when we increase the pressure, we start recruiting alveoli. And as you can see, this reactance is increasing, showing that uh, we are opening part uh, up uh, part of the lung. G uh, when we reach a uh, given pressure for this uh, uh, lung, uh, it was about uh, 14 centimeters of water, then you can see that there is a change in uh, the uh, shape of this core. So increasing the pressure is now no longer opening new alveolar unit, 
but it's just distending the tissue. So this region is something where we don't want to go because it means that we are distending uh, the tissue, we are uh, applying uh, large forces to the tissues without a benefit. We are not recruiting alveolar use. So this is why we want to go back uh, in the repetrizing uh, limb of this trial. And going back, uh, we can clearly see that uh, as known, uh, we uh, can get uh, a very recruited lung with a pressure that is lower compared to the one that we were used during the inflation lift. This is called the hysteresis, and this uh, difference between these two points represents the effect of the recruited maneuver that we did by increasing the pressure. So by using uh, this technology, we, we can uh, see at bedside how the mechanics of the lung is, uh, of our patient is changing uh, when we change uh, the peep of the ventilator. And uh, uh, this uh, tool is, uh, uh, easily implemented uh, into the ventilator. Uh, and there are several validation studies that we have done uh, in humans, uh, and, uh, but most in animal models at the beginning. Uh, here I uh, add uh, all these uh, references for uh, your convenience if you want to get into details. I would like to show just, just a couple of uh, uh, cases that uh, might be helpful to understand the kind of information we can get. This is an example of uh, uh, reactance versus mean airway pressure. As I was saying, this technology can be applied both in conventional mechanical ventilation and uh, HFO. And uh, this patient was receiving HFO, and we did uh, the PIP trials uh, before uh, treating him with steroids, and then we repeated the measurements just before extubation. What we can see is that uh, the, during uh, the acute condition, uh, the acute phase of RDS, we were able to identify the typical curve uh, of uh, the recruitable and the recruitable lung. And we were able to also identify which was the optimal mean uh, pressure, for example, for the patient in that condition that day in which we did the test. And then uh, what we can observe is that before extubation, the curve is completely different. You don't see hysteresis. The lung is uh, stable, is fully recruited already at uh, low mean pressure. And this is a good information we can have, uh, and we know that uh, uh, the treatment uh, was able to uh, reduce the, the areas that were uh, the recruit. But not only, we can also see that uh, the maximum recruitment that we were obtaining during uh, uh, the acute condition of the lung was not as high as uh, the similar value of reactance we got before extubation. This is also allowing us to understand that this baby had uh, also some part of the lung that was not recruitable by pressure. Might be fluids, might be area that uh, uh, the pressure that we reach were not able to recruit. Similar uh, information that can be uh, added on, other than uh, the uh, information for identifying the optimal pressure, are shown by this uh, case study in which we apply a oscillation also to monitor how lungs was changed, lung was changing in a patient receiving uh, ECMO due to an H1 and one infection. So. Here you can see that what the measurements was repeated several days apart, and then you can see the first measurements, we have negative reactance, we increase the pressure, and the, negative, the, the reactance is going down. No, no sign of any kind of recruitment, the lung was fully fluted, and there was no reason to apply a high pressure in the lung like this. We were just adding uh, uh, forces and damaging the area. Uh, we repeated the measurements the day after, and now uh, the lung started to show sign of recruitment. You can see that uh, uh, there is a loop, and there is a loop, and then you can identify what, which can be the optimal pressure to keep the lung open during the decreased limb. And then we repeated again the measurements, and we were able to observe the improvement of the lung, and then uh, we were able to identify the best time for uh, winning the patient from ECMO. So not only optimization of parameters, but also understanding the development of uh, the lung uh, disease. So this is why we also explore the use of uh, this technology to collect information useful for diagnosis and evaluation of treatments. So I'm showing very briefly just a few uh, uh, applications. Uh, one uh, is related to the possibility to predict days of mechanical ventilation. So the uh, understand the respiratory and predict the respiratory outcomes by looking 
uh, at this parameter together with other standard uh, criteria for uh, prediction. And we found that actually by using uh, FOT during uh, the first day of life, we were able to improve the capabilities of predictors to understand uh, the, the, to predict the future uh, of respira the respiratory act onto the patient, suggesting that uh, reactance is bringing an important information of the fragility of the lung. Uh, the similar results were obtained also applying this technology non-invasively. This is not yet available in mechanical commercial mechanical ventilator. It's technology that we are still under, still under development uh, in our lab. Uh, we need to compensate for the effect of the uh, mask and the upper airways, but uh, in the nasal pathway, uh, but we were able to study uh, uh, these studies. We had uh, 68 patients that were studied by uh, force oscillation nasal mask. And uh, we also uh, confirmed the previous finding, uh, finding that uh, the reactance was able to add significantly to simple clinical parameter in the prediction of the duration of the respiratory support. Now, another example of uh, application for evaluation of the patient in clinical setting is uh, the response to drug. Uh, we have seen uh, improvement uh, of the lung in the previous baby uh, thanks to the treatment with steroids. Uh, and uh, here you can see, uh, for example, the response of uh, the respiratory system through bronchodilators that can be easily obtained by repeating the measurements before and after the administration of bronchodilators. In this the BPD patients, we were able to identify patients that were not responding to bronchodilator. You can see that uh, the measurements done before and after the uh, administration were uh, over, completely overlapped. And we were able also to see that effect of uh, uh, patients in which there was a response. The final uh, slides, uh, I would like, this is uh, what we are actually trying to do now with uh, some of so these uh, hot activities of our research, uh, is uh, to use this technology uh, at birth uh, for uh, tailoring uh, respiratory uh, support and uh, surfactant. In these studies, we show that uh, we can use uh, FOT uh, birth and uh, evaluate uh, how the, what is the degree of the recruitment of the lung and uh, eventually use this information also for uh, potentially guiding application of recruitment maneuver. And uh, this is an example of a uh, effect of uh, sustained lung inflation reactance that you can see in patients that were derecruited back. And uh, in gray, you have another patient that was uh, starting, as you can see, with a much more recruited lung and uh, who were not benefited at all from the application of sustained lung inflation. Actually, the apnea that was following this uh, procedure was uh, actually inducing a derecruitment. So again, another tool that may be helpful for tailoring the, the support. And we also found uh, a very good agreement uh, between uh, the measurements of FOT done uh, in the, within the two, first uh, two hours of life uh, with the need of surfactant, uh, substance need of surfactant by uh, patients. This study that is uh, uh, now submitted, so under, under review, uh, we found that uh, uh, very interestingly, uh, we got some, uh, uh, most of the patients that was, uh, were needing surfactant showed a very negative reactance within the two hours of, from birth. But there were also patients that uh, were uh, having a negative reactance that didn't meet uh, uh, the criteria for uh, oxygen by the oxygenation based criteria for uh, uh, receiving surfactant. And in this case, we had uh, this. Uh, uh, the way we identified that these patients, uh, even if without, uh, uh, if, if they don't didn't receive surfactant, they were classified as patients with bad respiratory outcomes, uh, needing more than 28 uh, days of uh, respiratory support. So, in conclusion, uh, we can think that uh, the force oscillation technique may represent an effective tool for clinical evaluation of respiratory mechanics uh, at back bedside uh, and. This will open new opportunities for improving our personal capabilities to manage respiratory uh, disease uh, in newborns uh, by, of course, understanding, improving our capabilities for diagnosis and uh, evaluating the treatment uh, for optimized mechanical ventilation and uh, follow through uh, longitudinal assessment uh, the trajectory of uh, our patient. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Rafaela, for a great talk once more. A very interesting topic. Uh, I think we'll come back to your talk in the order of the presentations and start with questions uh, now from the audience that we got through the uh, questions and answer section. And there are several questions for Claire about high frequency oscillation and volume guarantee during high frequency oscillation. Uh, there is certainly a, a first question that was asking, is this now standard? And I would say it's not standard. And Manuel, Manuel can, uh, can confirm or correct me, but uh, Manuel Sanchez is pushing this for over the last year pretty forward. It's not standard because it's not available yet in all oscillators, unit oscillators on the market. But on the other hand, we have to remember that physiology of high frequency oscillations tells us for many years, and Manuel mentioned this in his presentation, the lower the tidal volume, the higher the frequency, the better the, the, the uh, protection of the lung. And actually, when you go back in the literature, Venegas in 1994, Chain Pillow in 2005, and Rafael Delacca in 2017, were showing that using higher frequencies, allowing for lower or leading to lower tidal volumes seem to be less harmful for harm, uh, less harmful for the lung because what we do not take in account in our reasoning is the pressure damping downside from the from the endotracheal tube to the lung and maybe uh, Manuel can uh, uh, comment on this as well well peter uh, you summarized very well uh, the comment um, of course, we have the evidence that um, for many years that using the lower tidal will prevent lung injury, not only on high frequency, but mostly on conventional mechanical ventilation. But, um, you know, of course, because of the damping, um, as you say, transmission of delta P is not going to be uh, a problem to, to the babies. The, the problem is when we are using uh, very large tidal volumes and you are not looking at this. And this is the problem. Some, some of the studies uh, many years ago were using very powerful ventilators without looking at the tidal volume that the ventilator were, were producing into the lungs of the babies. And probably the benefits, some of the benefits, potential benefits of high frequency were overlooked by the use of these very high tidal volumes during high frequency ventilation. Um, what the other thing we found is that the higher the frequency, the lower the tidal volume that you can use, you have to use. And this is probably you're very close to the resonance frequency. So, uh, well, it, because of the time we didn't show uh, most of the studies that we did, but we also find that the frequency close to from 18 to 20 Hertz, the tidal volume uh, used to be even lower, disproportionately lower than the tidal volume that we were using at, high, at lower frequencies. And this is probably because uh, DCO2 is not the same uh, uh, formula to be used when you're using very high frequencies. So, so we proposed to use a, modific a modification of this formula, mathematical formula, when you are using frequencies higher than 15 Hertz. So again, I think we have much uh, uh, time to, to learn about high frequency today. And new devices in probably in the near future will in, introduce this philosophy and uh, will probably help us to better understand uh, the use of this very, very low uh, tidal volume with these very high frequencies. Maybe I take the chance to ask Rafael about this topic and specifically on the issue on resonance frequencies. Do they matter in this setting, Raffaele? Is this is one of the reasons that we can go to such high frequencies because many great people question how can high can we go? How dangerous is for the premature baby to go to very high frequencies? Raffaele, can you comment on this? Just put on your mic, please. Yes. So uh, we also did some studies to understand the role of these uh, resonant frequencies uh, uh, in uh, uh, possibly effect, possible effects on the CO2. So for that, what we learned so far, uh, the mechanical condition of the uh, neonates are not uh, enough uh, to produce a potential um, underdumping effect 
that can lead uh, to uh, potential damage into the lung. So uh, I won't say that uh, this, there might be uh, an effect uh, of uh, a safety effect on the resonant frequency. And uh, we weren't able to see a big impact on the CO2 by reaching uh, different resonant frequencies. So uh, there is changing the frequency around the resonant frequency. So I'm not thinking that uh, uh, the moving around resonant frequency in the preterm babies is really affecting significantly the gas exchange or safety. Resonance frequency are in the range of 16 and higher usually, aren't they? And the premature baby in a 24 week, for example. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, can, I have can... another interesting question that comes up in for high frequency in general. And this was pointing out the question of choking points. Because Manuel showed in one of your figures that the pressure curve during the expiratory phase of oscillation went below zero. And there is a mindset that this might be dangerous because it should never go below zero because of the so-called choking points. Can you comment on this? Well, we have to remember that we are using mineral pressure to prevent this. So what we are showing is that uh, the uh, oscillation pressure is the pressure that is going below this mineral pressure, but it's not going below zero of the mineral pressure of the baby's lung. So this, this is the way. It's also because of the major damping through the airways. Absolutely, the airways. absolutely. Yeah. Then I have another question that came up several times, is the question, how do you choose your starting volume when you have frequency well, oscillation? And this... maybe it should be added, and how do you set your starting frequency? And what do you then next? Well, uh, you know, after so many years using this modality, we, we set a different target tidal volume to begin in our babies, uh, depending on the size of the lung of the baby. So depending on the birth weight. So we used to go around 1 or 1.1 in the smaller baby. And clearly we increased a little bit more in those babies in between 1500 grams and 2000 up to 1.7 or, or 2, even 2, or more than two in babies uh, born term. And then what we try to do is to set the higher frequency as possible and then decrease even more the tidal volume as much as we can. So uh, the initial uh, tidal volume is not the important thing. The important thing is how far you can go decreasing the tidal volume and how far you can go increasing the frequency as, as much as you can. So again, the smaller is the baby, the higher the frequency that you can use and the tidal volume is going to be the lower. And would it be fair to say that your number you start with, it's a number that you experienced with the baby lock, we have 500, which well, might not be at any price the same tidal volume with a different device with different oscillation characteristics. Yes, absolutely. And one, one important thing, Peter, that you are asking me about the VM500 is to, to have uh, a very clear that not every single ventilator is going to produce the same uh, volume guarantee modality when you are using it. And what is very important to know if uh, the ventilator that you are using is uh, having a software to leak the, or to compense, say, the leakage of uh, the tidal volume. Because if not, then you can probably are using very different tidal volumes that you are thinking that you are sending to the baby's lung. So leak compensation software must work uh, well. If not, uh, you are very um, uh, unaware about the possibility of uh, damaging the baby's lung. You're mute, Peter. Peter. Sorry, I have some connection problems. Uh, go back. So there was another question coming up about, uh, are there any large randomized controlled trials and is there some data of medium or long-term outcome so far? The question no. was uh, to Manuel. Well, uh, we don't have uh, randomized controlled trials uh, today. We have uh, long-term studies. In our babies, yeah, we have long cohort studies. And what we demonstrated at least babies are doing well in terms of neurodevelopmental 
at the 18 months of, um, of age, uh, very similar to babies uh, without the volume guarantee modality high frequency. So babies are doing uh, very well in terms of not, uh, not uh, worse than without the volume guarantee modality and even more. Um, with, with a combination of more uh, issues to, to prevent lung damage as given the surfactant by less invasive surfactant administration, we have decreased the number of babies with severe BPD two and three. So at least in the follow-up uh, babies that we have in our cohort, we have uh, good results in terms of safety and uh, lower number of babies with uh, severe BPD. Then you got the, another very classical question is the question about you should see the oscillations to the mid of the tie. What we observe with your settings, isn't this just uh, because in the old time we used low frequency and very important amplitudes and had no idea about what we are doing on this CO2? Or do you see your babies with the mid tie wiggling? Well, if you are asking me about if we are looking at the DCO2 really to control PCO2, yes, we do. Um, we know very well right now uh, what is the correlation between DCO2 and the size of the baby's lung. But we must remember that, that as you know, the bigger is the baby, the higher the DCO2 is going to be because uh, tidal volume is uh, applied by the square. So uh, using this in mind, we try to decrease the number of uh, PCO2 blood gas uh, studies or tests and controlling the babies, uh, looking at the DCO2 easier. So for us, it's uh, at least a very standard of care to look at the DCO2 and look at the, how the baby is doing really. And then the ventilator is controlled by itself, uh, Delta P and DCO2 as well. So you would say looking at the tie wiggling is an old fashioned way and we should completely forget it. Would you agree? Uh, absolutely, I do agree with you. So with this, we come uh, to an interesting uh, link to uh, DCO2 and targeting DCO2 and intelligent ventilation, because in high frequency oscillation, as Manuel mentioned, we could also think to target DCO2 if you know the, uh, the specific DCO2 for needy for this patient. So there comes the question a little bit to the intelligent ventilation. Uh, Tom, you mentioned uh, all about oxygenation control and you gave us some visions what should be developed next. And you mentioned the hydro volume, CO2 control, somewhere the control of uh, active minute ventilation. And to say that in the adult field, there is the so-called intelligent ventilation mode in one of the companies where they're targeting on the CO2 and even trying to reduce work of breathing. Is there any chance that we go further in this direction? I think so. I think there's potential there, but the, the biggest hurdle I think is that anti-tidal CO2 measurements, especially in extreme P terms, is just not very reliable. So I think that's the, the biggest hurdle is to get that measurement reliable uh, because as soon as we have that, uh, there's really no reason not to, uh, to optimize that. So yes, I think that's in the future. And along the line, you mentioned that most, and that's also a little bit our experience, that the most of the oxygen controls over, tend to overshoot more than undershoot the saturation targets. And you show nicely how the, the choice of the range, so a large or a smaller range, may influence this. So should we rethink these range settings and get them larger, broader? If yes, to the upper or to the lower end? Or should we stay just with some companies offers that they give us a certain range and we cannot modify? I think that the difficulty there is that it's really a trade-off to, okay, how do we see a bit of additional oxygen in comparison to a desaturation? And then depending on how deep and how long that is. And that's something we don't really know the answer to. Uh, ideally, we would have a, a flow chart basically saying, okay, 10% uh, more oxygen, that's better than a desaturation that's 5% and half a minute long. So we pick this, um, but that we don't really know. So then we, we need to make those choices. And I think that. Speaking as an engineer, you try and optimize the control parts to be 
as much in the target, but with that, we might be using a bit too much oxygen. So in reality, there probably is a trade-off there that we say, okay, we accept maybe not the best saturation at each time, um, but might make a bit of a slower algorithm that, that uses a bit less oxygen. But in, in reality, we have no idea where that balancing point is at the moment. Um, and again, that, that is probably a balancing point that's not the same for all patients. Um, so I think that's a, a really, really difficult question that I think nobody really knows the answer to. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> okay, then we have another question, same in the same line as for Manuel before. Did any of the RCTs with auction control improve BPD or long-term development outcomes? No, there, there have been no real large randomized control trials with closed loop yet. Um, mainly it has been single center uh, trials so far testing algorithms and mainly focusing on on time within the targets, oxygen use, all, all short-term outcomes. Uh, and to my knowledge, the, the FIO2C trial that's uh, uh, headed now by uh, by the group of Alexander Franz is really the, the first big trial looking into a yeah, long-term outcome. Uh, and I think everybody uh, within this field is, is really looking forward to yeah, what the results will be. Um, and that yeah, we have to wait for, unfortunately. Okay, let's move on to Raffaele. Uh, as we discuss, discussed about intelligent ventilation aspects and then closed group controls, would you see FOT in the future to be integrated in such protocols to expand the closed loop control on oxygen, CO2, and lung volumes, optimal lung volumes, or is this also just wishful thinking? Oh, I think, uh, I mean, this will be uh, for sure one of the most interesting future applications where we are developing several technologies that, uh, as you were saying, are able to manage different variables that are needed to be optimized for ventilation. Uh, FOT is providing one very interesting variable uh, to be take into account. Uh, so I really think that the future will be the possibility not to create uh, individual closed loop uh, by creating uh, algorithms that are able to consider several uh, measurements, uh, several different physiological measurements in order to optimize the ventilation. Uh, the I agree what, with Tom that the critical situation we are facing now is the possibility to have a, a very accurate and reliable measurement. So all these closed loop controllers relies on the, the input they have. So if you have uh, very accurate measurements of uh, CO2, of uh, respiratory mechanics, uh, of uh, SpO2, then uh, you can implement the nicest possible control load that uh, optimize ventilation. Unfortunately, this is very difficult to get in a real neonatal intensive care. Uh, we know that uh, just saturation, which is a very simple uh, information, we know how many times uh, the saturation probes can move and provide unreliable data and so on. So there is always an important uh, integration of information that is done by the physician that is able to understand uh, if uh, there is a technical, uh, the measurements is not technically reliable, that is compensating for this. Uh, in order to create a reliable closed loop controller, we need to found uh, more accurate measurements, in my opinion, because uh, uh, this is a very critical aspect. I think we have time for a very short last question, a short answer, please. Uh, there's coming one in that was asking, is the data showing that force oscillation technique could, use, could be used and help with extubation success or determine the cause of failed extubation? Not yet. There are no studies, to my knowledge, in neonatal uh, uh, the neonatal fields that are uh, uh, so there are. Uh, I, I know that there are people collecting data on this, but uh, I'm not aware of results uh, uh, making uh, a strong correlation between uh, the mechanical condition of the lung and uh, extubation failures. But your single case on ECMO goes in this direction. Well, it, it mo yes, but because uh, in this I mean, uh, in this patient. The mechanical condition of the lung was an extremely important proxy to understand what was happening because with ECMO, it's very difficult to understand the, the gas exchange and so on. So depending, uh, again, there is not a rule that good for everybody and uh, every patient. So, so depending on the clinical uh, problem of the patient, uh, you can get uh, info, uh, 
I mean, the, the information about mechanical condition of the lung can be extremely helpful. Or uh, uh, if the extubation problem is related, for example, to the drive and, and muscle fatigue, and you can have an idea of the load, but uh, how this load is coped by the respiratory control, this is another problem. So the problem is to, very complex. Yeah. I have to hand over to Daniele. Yeah, well, that's a very complex issue. And um, I tend to agree with Raffaele that it is not for everybody, also because to the best of my knowledge, correct me if I'm wrong, but all the studies have been done in babies with RDS, so pre and babies with primary fat and deficiency. They could be a little bit different when on top of that, you got sepsis, you got pulmonary hemorrhage or any other stuff. Uh, so probably having a, a stiffer lung and a, and a more uh, severe situation. Um, so uh, just to uh, go back to the uh, comment about the CO2 retention, uh, I agree that there is no problem in this regard. I'm very curious to see if this will be the same when the uh, lung injury is more pronounced, you know, and, and so the uh, capability of the epithelium to exchange CO2, it's a little bit affected. Uh, anyway, these are all very uh, nice, uh, uh, you know, food for tabs for the future. So. Uh, I hope we'll be discussing about that in the future as well. So I guess we have no more time, although we have a lot of questions, correct me if I'm wrong. So shall I, shall I close the, uh, this very nice webinar, which has been only the first one, uh, hopefully. And I uh, would like to thank you everyone for being here and particularly all of you. So Rafael, Tom, Manuel, Peter, and uh, obviously uh, all of you, we, at almost 700 attendees, so it's a, I would say it's a huge success. So hope to see you uh, very soon in the future here and hopefully uh, in person. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.